Good morning. Today is Thursday, the 16th of September. O oh, send out your light and your truth, that they may lead me and bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and apart from your grace there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us, spare all those who confess their faults, restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the depths of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. O come, let us adore him. Psalm 35 Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me, and fight against those who fight against me. Take up the shield and buckler, and stand up to help me. Bring forth the spear and bar, the way against those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion who imagine evil against me. Let them be as the chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord scatter them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For they have secretly laid their net to destroy me without a cause. Indeed, without a cause have they made a pit to take away my life. Let sudden destruction come upon them unawares, and the net which they have laid secretly catch themselves, that they may fall into their own trouble. Then shall my soul be joyful in the Lord, I shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you? You deliver the poor from those who are too strong for them, indeed the poor and those who are in misery from those who rob them. Malicious witnesses rise up. They charge me with matters I know nothing about. They repay me evil for good, to the great sorrow of my soul. Nevertheless, when they were sick, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. I prayed with my whole heart, as if it had been my friend or my brother. I behaved myself as one who mourns for his mother, as I bowed down from with heaviness of my heart. But in my adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Indeed, those who struck me came together against me, and I had no rest. They tore at me and would not cease. When I stumbled, they mocked me exceedingly and gnashed at me with their teeth. Lord, how long will you look on this? O oh, deliver me from the calamities that, bring upon, that they bring upon me, and my life from the lions. So will I give you thanks in the great congregation. I will praise you among the peoples. 
Let not those who are my enemies triumph over me deceitfully. Neither let them wink with their eyes those who hate me without a cause. For their talking is not of peace, but they have imagined deceitful words against those who are quiet in the land. They open their mouths at me and say, Aha! Aha! We saw it with our own eyes. This you have seen, O Lord. Hold not your tongue, then. Be not far from me, O Lord. Awake and stand up to judge my case. Avenge my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not triumph over me. Let them who say in their hearts, Aha! We have, si we have what we want. Neither let them say we have devoured him. Let them be put to confusion and shame who rejoice at my trouble. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who boast against me. Let them be glad and rejoice who favor my righteous cause. Indeed, let them say always, Great is the Lord who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And, as for my tongue, it shall be talking of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the first book of Kings, beginning, beginning with the seventh chapter, the first verse. Solomon was building his own house thirteen years, and he finished his entire house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was one hundred cubits, and its breadth fifty cubits, and its height thirty cubits, and it was built for four rows of cedar pillars, with cedar beams on the pillars. And it was covered with cedar above the chambers, so that on the forty of so that there were on the forty five pillars fifteen in each row. There were window frames in three rows, and window opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and windows had square frames, and windows were opposite window in three tiers. He And he made the hall of pillars. Its length was fifty cubits, and its breadth thirty cubits. There was a porch in front with pillars, and a canopy in front of them. And he made the hall of the throne where he was to pronounce judgment, even the hall of judgment. It was finished with cedar from floor to rafters. His own house, where he was to dwell in the other court back of the hall, was, like, was of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken in marriage. All these were made of costly stones, cut according to measure, and sawed with saws, back and front, even from the foundation uh, to the coping, uh, which was, and from the outside to the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, huge stones, stones of eight and ten cubits, and above were costly stones, cut according to measurement in cedar. The great court had three courses of cut stone all around, and a course of cedar beams, uh, so had the inner court of the house of the Lord, and the vestibule of the house. And King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a working worker in bronze. And he was full of wisdom, understanding, and skill of making any work in bronze, and he came to King Solomon and did all his work. He cast two pillars of bronze, Eighteen cubits was the height of one pillar, and a line of twelve cubits measured its circumference. It was hollow, and its thickness was four fingers. The second pillar was the same. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the tops of the pillars. The height of the one capital was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. There were lattices of checker work, uh, with wreaths of chain work on the capitals of the top of the pillars, a lattice for one capital and a lattice for the other capital. Likewise, he'd made pomegranates in two rows around one lattice work to cover the capital that was on the top of the pillar, and did the same with the other capital. 
Now the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars in the vestibule were of lily work, four cubits. The capitals were on the top pillars and also above the rounded projection, which was beside the lattice work. There were two hundred pomegranates in two rows all around, and so with the other capital. He set up the pillars at the vestibule of the temple, and he set up the pillar on the south and called its name Jachim, and he set up the pillar on the north and called its name Boaz, and on the tops of the pillars was lily work. Thus the work of the pillars was finished. Then he made the sea of cast metal. It was round, ten cubits from brim to brim, five cubits high, and a line of thirty cubits measuring in circumference. Under its brim were gourds with ten cubits compassing, compassing the sea all around. The gourds were in two rows cast with it when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, uh, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south, and three facing east. The sea was set on them, and all their rear parts were inward. Its thickness was a hand breadth, and its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held two thousand baths. He also made the ten stands of bronze. Each stand was four cubits long, four cubits wide, three cubits high. This was the construction of the stands. They had panels, and the panels were set in frames, and on the panels they were set in the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. On the frames, both above and below the lions and oxen, there were wreaths of beveled work. Moreover, each stand had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and at the four corners were supports for the basins. The supports were cast with wreaths on the side of each. Its opening was within a crown that projected upward one cubit. Its opening was round, as a pedestal is made, a cubit and a half deep. At its opening there were carvings, and its panels were square, not round. And the four wheels were underneath the panels, and the axles of the wheels were on one piece with the stands, and the height of a wheel was a cubit and a half. The wheels were made like a chariot wheel. Their axles, their rims, their spokes, their hubs were all cast. There were four supports at the four corners of each stand. The supports were of one piece with the stands. And on the top of the stand there was a round band, a half a cubit high, and a top of its stand, its stays, and its panels were one piece with it. And on the surface of its stays and on its panels, he carved cherubim, lions, and palm trees, according to the space of each, with wreaths all around. All this manner he made the tin stands. All them were cast alike, of the same measure and the same form. And he made ten basins of bronze. Each basin held forty baths. Each basin measured four cubits, and there was a basin for each of the ten stands. And he set the stands, five on the south side of the house, and five on the north side of the house, and he set the sea at the southeast corner of the house. Hiram also made the pots, the shovels, and the basins. So Hiram finished all the work that he did for King Solomon on the house of the Lord. And the two pillars and the two bowls of the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars and the two lattice works to cover the two bowls at the capitals were on the top of the pillar. And four hundred pomegranates for the two lattice works, two rows of pomegranates for each lattice work to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the pillars. And the ten stands and the ten basins on the stands and the one sea and the twelve oxen underneath the sea. Now the pots, the shovels, the basins, and all the vessels in the house of the Lord which Hiram made for King Solomon were of burnished bronze. In the plain of the Jordan the king cast them, in the clay between Sukkoth and Zazim. And Solomon left all the vessels unweighed, because there were so many of them the weight of the bronze was not ascertained. So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden altar, the golden table for the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the south side and five on the north, before the inner sanctuary, the flowers, the lamps, the tongues the, of gold, the cups, snuffers, basins, dishes for incense, and fire pans of pure gold, and the sockets of gold for the doors of the innermost part of the house, the most holy place, 
and for the doors of the nave of the temple. Thus, all the work that King Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished, and Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and stored them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I will sing to the Lord, for he is lofty and uplifted. The horse and its rider has he hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my refuge. The Lord has become my Savior. This is my God, and I will praise him, the God of my people, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a mighty warrior. The Lord is his name. The chariots of Pharaoh and his army has he hurled into the sea. The finest of those who bear armor have been drowned in the Red Sea. The fathomless deep has overwhelmed them. They sank into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in might. Your right hand, O Lord, has overthrown the enemy. Who can be compared with you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, awesome in renown, and worker of wonders? You stretched forth your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. With your constant love you led the people you redeemed. You brought them in safety to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them on the mount of your possession, the resting place you have made for yourself, O Lord, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands has established. The Lord shall reign forever and forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the Epistle of the Hebrews, beginning with the seventh chapter, the first verse. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils? And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have descent uh, from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with the tribe Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of legal requirement concerning his bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, quote, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, end quote. For, one, for on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, 
a better hope is introduced, do, introduced through which we draw near to God. And it is not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, quote, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. End quote. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of his people, since he did not once for all, excuse me, since he did this once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of of God the Father. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Come Holy Spirit on this day and remind us of the great works that you have done and are doing and the great work of salvation from Jesus, our great high priest, so that all, every man, woman, and child from all tribes, nations, peoples, nationalities, every human being, may come within the reach of your Son's saving embrace. Amen. Today is also Yom Kippur, the, the uh, Day of Atonement, if I have that correct. I was double-checking it because, you know, the older I get, the uh, easier uh, one can um, <laughs> one can forget. So give me a moment. I, I don't want to misstate here. So it says the Day of Atonement is after the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. On this day, Jews ask God for forgiveness um, for the sins and secure their fate. So, what is Yom Kippur? Um, these are the dates of the most highly. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, September, uh, and then Yom Kippur, which is uh, today's date. So, it's interesting, and again, God has a wonderful way of connecting dots that in Hebrews today, we're talking about Jesus, the great high priest. Unlike the Levitical priests who descend from Aaron, um, the point is being made that Jesus is like Melchizedek, the king and priest of Salem. Salem is identified as the old city, the future city of Jerusalem, the city of peace. And so we have in the scriptures this priest-king figure of Salem who 
Abraham pays a tithe to. He's not of the descent of Abraham. He's a priest king of Salem. And as we, like I just mentioned, that was, that was the future Jerusalem. And the place where God's temple that we read about today in our first lesson, the temple is built and, and King Solomon builds his palace next to the temple. There's stairs that connect the two. So both are built on what we call today the Temple Mount. And, you know, you think about that from a symbolic standpoint. The king's palace is literally right next door to God's throne room. The king's throne room next to God's throne room. Now, of course, God is, he doesn't need a throne room. <laughs> But the temple is that place where God chose and said, you can build my house here. That you... So I want you to not be confused by that, but there's that physical location of the temple that Solomon built and his house next to it. It might be something that we can think about too as we, we understand that the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, Jesus dwells within each individual and corporately amongst the body of Christ, the believers, the church, um, that we prepare a house in our heart for the Holy Spirit, for Christ to dwell. And if you kind of look at it there, the, the house of the King and the house of the Lord are right next to each other. They're not far, they're not separated. And, and you know, if we think about the, the secular lives that we live in this world and the temple lives that we live in this world, they shouldn't be separated. They should be all in our body uh, so that um, uh, that we... We understand that we follow and worship God through his son, Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, not just on Sundays for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes or so, but every day of our life. We wake up in the morning and we say, thank you, Lord, for this day. We go to bed at night saying, Lord, thank you for this evening. May I rest in peace and sleep tonight and awake tomorrow into your presence, whether it be on earth or in heaven. And as we begin a new day, we dedicate it, if you will, to the Lord. You see, house, physical house and house of God closely together. I think there's something we can apply in our lives there. And when we look on Hebrews, you know, Hebrews is that in this passage here, again, the, the point being made is God is doing something new with Jesus. And, and old, he's fulfilling his promise about the Messiah his promise made to Abraham, through your descendants all will be blessed. But he's making a distinction between the priesthood of Aaron and Levi, if you will, passed on by descent, father to son. Uh, and, and he's saying here, uh, Jesus is getting his power from God. Melchizedek in the scriptures has no genealogy. We don't know anything about him except he was the king and priest of Salem, and Abraham offered him a tithe. We don't know much more about his genealogy. He's from outside, influencing inward, and he's receiving tithes from Abraham himself. That makes him unique, sort of like a son of God figure. And the author of Hebrews is pointing out Jesus is unique like that. It's not out of the weakness of men, but out of the power of God that Jesus descends. After all, we recognize him as the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus is God. He's not just a man. And so that's sort of being fleshed out here in this comparison between Melchizedek and, and Jesus. And in comparison to the Levitical priesthood, which is temporary. And as the law does its purpose, I mean, God sets it up for a period of time, but now it's been superseded by the priesthood of Christ, who doesn't die who offered himself as the sacrifice, and he continues to live and intercede for us. You know, that's, that's all being pointed out here. So we, we know that Jesus is the one. We need not look for another. And so we have, as it says, uh, the law appoints a son who has been made perfect. Uh, excuse me. Uh, it points a son who has been made perfect forever. That's Jesus. And so in that perfection of him, we have the offer of salvation. Not dependent on ourselves, but dependent on him and his works. 
full of grace and mercy for all those who would call upon him, say, I'm sorry for my sins. I repent. I change from my ways. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I ask for your help. Help me. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. I want to do right. I struggle to do right. Help me do right. But more importantly, I trust in you, Jesus, as my Savior and as my Lord. The spotlight, the emphasis is on God and His Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The emphasis is not on us. We are the receivers of grace. God is the giver of grace. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. And now as our Savior Jesus taught us, let us boldly pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. O God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we're ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh. And hasten the coming of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. At this time I invite your prayers, intercessions, thanksgivings and the like, as the Holy Spirit leads you in heart and mind, soul and body. Let us take this time now for our individual prayers to be offered up. Let us pray.
as we close this portion of our prayers, I continue to ask your prayers for Chip Edgar, for Rob Sturdy, for Chris Warner, the three godly men who have allowed their names to be put forward for Bishop Coadjutor. We continue to pray for Mark, our bishop at this time. and I just ask that the Lord will reveal which of these three godly men he wishes uh, to have to serve as our next diocesan bishop. We appreciate your prayers for that. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all generations, all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and, in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, have a wonderful Thursday. You are richly blessed by the Lord. Pass that blessing in the name of Christ and to the glory of God. Pass it on to others throughout this day with joy and a sense of purpose. For you are a child of God and Jesus died so that you, through him, may have everlasting life and be freed from the bondage of sin and enjoy the privilege of being an heir through Christ of the Father. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a blessed day.